Whew. All right, so it's been a, a really awesome weekend. Um, as you may know, we, we held a conference this weekend, and it wasn't like a conference like you would think with breakout sessions and a lot of other things. It was a conference that had worship and preaching and praying, and that was it. And it was, I was surprised by how good it was and how much the, the Lord really moved through the word preached and through the worship and just being together with, I don't know, seven or eight different churches from all over Cleveland. And uh, it was really good. And as I sat down with the scripture for, that's printed in your bulletins, um, I just kept coming back to this passage from Amos. And this is, the, this is the passage that I preached for the conference. And Pastor Joe texted me and he said, it'd be really great if we could just replay your sermon from Friday night in the service. And I'm like, well, that's just confirmation that I'll just preach it again for the service. So if you were here during the conference, you're going to hear this the second time. If you weren't, which I think is a lot of you, then you will hear it for the first time. And so um, it fits along, believe it or not. If you, if you see where we have been in Luke, the gospel of Luke, this fits along. And it fits along because God has inspired the words that we read. He's, he's inspired our scripture and and, you know, we often think there's a lot of different writers that are writing, and that's true. But it's writers who have been inspired by God to put down the words that he's inspired them to write. And it's, it's his plan that as Scripture unfolds, those things are connected. So it's not an accident that we'd be talking about from last week, uh, Jesus teaching on the day of the Lord, really. And then we go to a completely different Scripture in one of the minor prophets, Amos, and see him talking about the day of the Lord. And it, it's not a surprise. So I'm going to read one more scripture, then we'll pray and we'll jump in it. And this is Galatians chapter 2. The theme of the conference was, was Galatians chapter 2, verse 2. And so I want to, I want to read that because it's going to set the, the table for uh, how we unpack Amos today. So this is, this is Galatians chapter 2, verse 2. And this is the Apostle Paul writing. And he writes this, he says, I went... In response to a revelation and set before them the gospel I preach among the Gentiles. But I did this privately to, to those who seemed to be leaders for fear that I was running or had run my race in vain. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you so much for your word, the way that it weaves this, together this, this story of your redemption, the story of the way in which you work in our lives to save us, to bring us to salvation. Lord, I pray that our hearts are open this morning that we would see you and seek you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. On the day of the race, Dorara, Harissa from Ethiopia did everything the same as he'd always done. He, he, he prepared for the race the exact same way that he did for every single marathon he ran. Even though he was in Vienna for the Viennese uh, marathon, he, he prepared the same. He woke up at the same time. He ate the same food. He put on the same clothing down to the same shoes, which ended up being a little bit of a mistake, as we'll see in just a second. But he did everything the same. And in that moment when he was putting on his shoes, he, he looked at over, over at, the, at the new shoes that he'd bought for the race and decided not to wear those because he, he wanted to go with what was comfortable and what he was used to. Because he felt it would make him run faster and better. And, and of course he did. He ran that race very fast and he won the marathon. He won it by three seconds. And it was great. And he, and he stood at the finish line and he was celebrating until the officials came over and they pulled him aside and they measured the soles of his shoes. And the soles of his shoes were one centimeter too thick. The shoes he'd bought for the race would have worked fine. They were great. But the, but the shoes he was used to, the ones he had trained in, were just one centimeter too thick. It broke the rules and he was disqualified. 
On the day of another race, Omar Ahmed prepared the race for the race the same way that he, he had for every other race that he'd ran. And he had run this race many times before. The Bristol City 10K. And he was ready for this race because it had been canceled the year before because of COVID. And so he's excited to, to get back into the, the normalcy, the, the swing of things. The only thing different about this race on this particular year was they had combined two races that usually were run on different days. The, the 10K and the half marathon. 10K being like a little bit over six miles, half marathon being around 13 miles. Correct me if you're a runner. And, and they combined the two, but he wasn't worried because that wasn't going to affect him because he was running a shorter race. And he was right up until he got to the point where the 10K turns to go back to the finish line. He misread the signs and he kept on going and he ran the half marathon mistakenly. And you might wonder, how in the world does somebody run an extra seven miles by mistake, but he did, and not only did he run it, but he ran it well, and he won the half marathon, and he crossed the finish line, and I don't know what was going on through his mind, but he crossed the finish line, realized he was in first place, celebrated, I don't even know if he had realized he'd run the half marathon at this point, but he was celebrating until the race officials came, they pulled him aside, and they said, congratulations, man, but you, you ran the wrong race. You didn't register for the half marathon, and you're disqualified. These two runners had run their races with everything they had. They had run them well. They had trained. They had prepared. They poured their lives into, into those races, into what they were doing. They put so much energy and so much effort into those races. They'd given everything, and they'd finished well. They all won. But through mistakes that they had made at some point in the race, they were disqualified. It didn't matter how hard they had trained. It didn't matter how much and how fast they ran. It didn't even matter that they had no clue that they had violated the rules. What was true is they had violated the rules and they were disqualified. And in Galatians 2, Paul goes up to Jerusalem to meet with the leadership of the church at the time, to make sure that he wasn't running his race in vain. That he hadn't been doing all the things he was doing, that he hadn't been expending the, the energy that he was expending in a way that was useless or didn't matter. Or when it was all said and done, would say, you ran this thing in vain. Because what Paul was doing was radical. I think we sometimes miss out just how radical it is that Paul, what Paul in the early church is doing. Paul was crossing a dividing line that had been in place for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. A line that said if you were a Gentile, you had no place in the family of God for the most part. But Paul understood that the good news of Jesus Christ taught that something different. The good news was that God was expanding his family... And was welcoming anyone into the faith who would come to Jesus Christ. He was bringing in brothers and sisters from all over the world. Not just Jews. And not just the wealthy. Not just the good looking. And not just those who can maintain religious purity. Or say the right kinds of things. He was welcoming anyone who would come to Jesus. The gospel is radical. It takes all the expectations of the world and it turns them on their heads. The world teaches that we have to make our way, that we have to earn our keep, that we have to hustle to get by, and if we don't, we're a failure. The world teaches us that if you don't get the right education or come from the right place or have the right skin color or the right accent or think the right things, then you aren't good enough. And the gospel flies in the face of that kind of thinking. The gospel flattens our differences. Neither Jew nor Gentile, free nor slave, male nor female. It flattens our differences. It doesn't do away with our differences. They're still there. But what I mean by it flattens our differences is the things that are unique to our situations. The things that make us who we are. Don't give us value. 
What Paul is teaching is that whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, your value is the same. And that's radical. It's radical at this time because if you were a Jew, you felt that you were better than any Gentile. You just knew it. If you were a Gentile, you felt you were better than the Jews. And these are the people that God brings together in the early church. And there's tension all through the first, second, third centuries beyond. Because we still don't have it figured out. But there's tension there. Real tension. And it's radical what Paul's doing. And he wants to make sure he's on the right track. I mean, he had a revelation from Jesus. So I think this is a rhetorical thing that Paul's doing here. He knows he knows he's on the right track because Jesus is told he, he is. He's just being respectful of leadership and just making sure that they're, they're on the same page as they go forward. He doesn't want to end the race and learn that it's been all wrong. Because how sad, how sad and devastating to reach the end of the race only to learn that it had been run in vain. We all run a race. And one day we will stand before the Lord and we will answer for our lives. There will come a day, that day, the day of the Lord. And how horrifying and sad to learn on that day, a day that it's too late to change, that we've run the race in vain. This is where Amos helps us a little. Because the Israelites of that time, they are running, uh, for sure running the race in vain. And they don't have a clue. They think they're okay. And Amos helps us as we, as we go through this text this morning. Because how chilling to read those words, to read, Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. That's a picture of the end of the race. The day of the Lord is a picture of those who thought they had run the race well and they were longing for that day when God would come and he would bring his judgment and his wrath on all those who weren't running the race well. And they're cheering for and longing for the reward that they think that they will receive. And they cheer on the coming of the Lord and his wrath and his judgment thinking that they're good and that they're going to make it through that they have won. They expect salvation and redemption from God. They expect him to come down on their side. The Lord of hosts. Against all the nations that oppose them. His wrath focused on their enemies. When in actuality God tells them. On that day God's wrath will be turned on them. I can think of no more scarier image in all the Bible than this image. An image of a people standing before God thinking that they are secure when they are not. Standing before God when it's too late to go back and change anything. Fully and finally judged. It's the same kind of chilling picture we see in Matthew chapter 25. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father... Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick and in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you, truly, who whatever you did for one of the least of these, brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. 
They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. That's a picture of running the race in vain. One that's irreversible and unchangeable. It is one that the Israelites are in danger of facing. Even as they long for the day of the Lord. The day of God's judgment. And it's a warning for us too. How is that possible? How is it possible to come to this point? To come to the point where you think you stand justified before God. Sure of your standing before God and not be. James Montgomery Boyce said that there's two stages to spiritual decline. There is the first stage marked by a pattern of a life where a person lives for themselves and at this stage recognizes the sin that that they're living in. They know what is right and what is wrong And they'll get around to doing right at some point further down the line. One day. But the imagined benefits of the sin that they're in right then and there far outweigh the immediacy. They're flirting with and testing out the the sin that they're in and it it seems to far outweigh the negatives. They know what they are doing is wrong, but they put it out of, of mind. Kind of Set it aside so it's kind of over here, but you're not really thinking about it. It's just kind of sitting to the side. They may know that that injustice has happened, but it's not affecting them right now. And it's over here, and so they don't have to pay attention to it. They they may know that their lives are not living, they're not living lives of righteousness, but there'll be time to get right with God eventually. And it's set off to the side. It's kind of like getting into a hot tub. So you, you get into a hot tub after a big group of kids have gotten out of that hot tub. And you know what happened in that hot tub. We hope that their parents taught them not to use the bathroom in the hot tub. But the odds are they didn't. But the water feels really good. So you trust that the chlorine is going to work and you're just going to sit down in it and you're going to relax. Even though you know over here... Stuff has happened. Here it feels really good. And it's relaxing. And so while sin is there. It's there. You know it's there. But this feels good. And you just kind of put off the idea of judgment. And of wrath. It's off in the distance. The day of the Lord is a scary. It's still a scary idea. But you just don't think about it. But the second stage, and this is the most deadly, is the point where sin so traps and befuddles the mind that your your thinking is distorted and your heart is hardened. And you actually convince yourselves, they actually convince themselves that they're in the right, that they're justified. That, that there's nothing to fear or be worried about. And that their deeds will be okay. The ju- injustice that they knew was happening, it's not really bad now. The unrighteousness that's coming out of their life that used to bother them doesn't seem so bad now. And pretty soon a person is fooled into believing that what is wicked is seen in, as being okay in God's sight. That in some way their actions and conduct will be vindicated. For the people of Israel in the book of Amos, this is where they are at. They imagine that what they're doing is is vindicated. It's, It's justified. That they stand faultless before God. Amos chapter 2 gives us a little picture of that kind of thing. The kind of thing that the Israelites are engaged in. They sell 
the poor into slavery. They sell their fellow Israelites into slavery because they cannot pay their debt. And I, I can imagine the rationalization that took place when this, ha- when this happened. I can imagine an Israelite saying, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have sold my, my brother or sister Israelite into slavery, but they should have paid me back. They should have paid. Their, how irresponsible of them not to, not to pay their debt, to put me in this place where I now have to sell them into slavery. And you can imagine how that conversation in, in, in the mind goes. I'm just getting my money back. It's not my problem they can't pay their debt. My fear is that this, this could be, this kind of thing could be going on in our lives and we would be blissfully unaware of it. Blissfully unaware of how far we may have fallen. And Amos could very easily be talking to us. Easily be warning us not to be quite so sure of ourselves. Not quite so blind to our own decline. We don't know much about the prophet Amos. We know that he was a shepherd, farmer. He was from a little town in the, just south of Jerusalem, Tekoa. That he was sent to Israel, the northern kingdom, during the reign of Jeroboam II. What's interesting about this time period is that Israel, the northern kingdom, was thriving. The economy was thriving. The the people were comfortable. The country was probably at its its wealthiest level that had been since Solomon. They were doing very good for themselves. They weren't suffering. They were in a good place. In fact, from the outside, everything looked good. Economically, they would have said, hey, we are being blessed by God. They gave lip service to the idea that they worshipped and loved God. The, The surface level was there. It looked right. But consistently throughout the book of Amos, there's this picture that begins to come clearer and clearer. They've sold fellow Israelites into slavery. They actually have no respect or fear of God. They oppress the poor and the needy, oblivious to the suffering of others. The very place where people should find justice in the courts, it is gone. There is nothing but injustice. And yet they think all is good. The Israelites have disconnected from reality. They have no fear of God, no worry about how God feels about their action. They actually think the day of the Lord will be a good thing. They think in verse 19 that it will be a day of safety for them. But but find on that day, rather than escaping the fire, they have jumped straight into the frying pan. At the moment when they think they've escaped from the lion, they will face the bear. At the moment when they think they've reached the safety of their home and they can take a deep breath and rest and put their hand on the wall, a snake will bite them. They will not find refuge on the day of the Lord. They will not find peace. They will not find what should be a day of celebration and light for God's people. Instead, they will find darkness and God's wrath. The imagery of darkness here throughout the Old Testament is an image of God's wrath. And it even carries on into the New Testament too. Jesus talks of people facing God's wrath in the New Testament. In that same chapter that we read earlier from Matthew 25. Where the faithful servant is told, well done good and faithful servant. But the unfaithful servant is told away from me. And is thrown out into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The religious rituals, the assemblies, the burnt offerings, the worship songs, all of those things that they thought would bring them safety and a good standing before God are abruptly and suddenly, they learn, useless. That God hates. What he wants from his people are two things. Verse 24. These are very telling things, and they carry into the New Testament justice and righteousness. He wants them to flow out of his people like water. 
that in some way there are to be these springs of water that outflow of their lives are justice and righteousness, that they will care for other people and how others are treated and seen and that they'll care about God and respect what he wants in their lives. It's a picture that Jesus brings us when he's talking about the greatest commandments. Love God, righteousness, and love your neighbor as yourself, justice. That's what God wants. He doesn't want us to cover our lives in this, the religious rituals that we think cover all of our shortcomings. He doesn't want us to play at church as if that's something that makes us look good in his sight. He wants who he is and his desire for humanity to come from deep in us in a way that falls on the land and renews and refreshes it. Just like the same way a, a never failing stream would refresh a desert land. He wants us changed in the way our desires and passions align with his desires and passions. That his love for people would be reflected in our love for people and his character of holiness would be reflected in our lives. To run the race well, to not run it in vain, is to practice justice and righteousness, not to play at church. A few years ago, my, we got my daughter a play kitchen, and it mimics a real kitchen. It's really cool. It's got a plastic stove top. It's got a, a refrigerator, and it's got the little... It's like a little ice maker that actually works and, uh, it, you know, sink and cabinets and a microwave and an oven. And it's really cool and it's really cute because I'll sit there and my daughter will, you know, she'll make me a meal, you know, plastic steak, some, pra you know, plastic broccoli and, pra you know, plastic hot dog and then a cookie on top. It's a great meal. And she'll bring it to me and I'll play, pretend like I'm eating it and it's really yummy and great and good. And it's awesome because she's, she's kind of learning about life and she's, she's practicing life and it's really cool and neat. Now what would not be cool and neat is if in 15 years she comes to me because she's been playing in her little kitchen and she brings me plastic steak and a plastic potato. That's not cute, it's just weird. Because we expect that to, 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 to move beyond that, to be shaped by that, yes, but to move beyond that and that, that shaping kind of Progress into adulthood. The things we do here on Sunday mornings, they're vitally important. We gather together. We worship. We pray. We, we hear God's word preached and it shapes us. But if we leave here and we're not changed and we're not taking this out into the world with us, we're just playing at church. If it hasn't... In, it's probably not a good word, infected us, renewed us, changed us to go out into the world, then what we do here is just surface level, and Scripture tells us God detests it. He hates it. God is merciful. He's good. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want anyone to stand at the day of the Lord and it be too late. 2 Peter 3 tells us, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But there will come a day, if you keep reading that passage in Peter, 2 Peter, there will come a day the day of the Lord will come like a thief. God doesn't leave his people in their ignorance. He, he warns them. He, he tips them off. We do, all of us, we, we run the race in vain. From the day we come out of our mom's womb, we run the race in vain. Living for ourselves, pursuing things that we want, selfish and self-seeking. But God sees that. And he doesn't leave us in that. He doesn't leave us with no kind of way out. Instead, he has sent prophet after prophet to warn until he himself comes. He comes to the earth and he says, I am the light of the world. 
And anyone who follows after me will never walk in darkness. Never face the darkness of the day of the Lord. Because he faces it for us. Jesus hangs on the cross. And the gospel writers all tell us that as Jesus hangs on the cross, darkness comes over the land. And we see in Luke 23, 44, it was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon for the sun stopped shining. Jesus faced the darkness of judgment for us. And without him, we would have no hope. We wouldn't be able to stand the day of the Lord. We would all run in vain. Now this frees us to see the world in a specific way. A different way. If I know that I'm only righteous, that I'm only good through Jesus Christ, then I can see things in a different way. I can face things, hard truths in a different way that maybe I couldn't before. The, the gospel can help, exp, help us expose where we are blind. Because often our blindness is willful. Because we're afraid to face the truth. We don't want to acknowledge how bad we actually are. But the gospel helps us to face that. It can, it can expose our blindness. We, we can acknowledge what is wrong with the world. We can acknowledge what's wrong in our own lives and we can own it and not be afraid of it. I don't have to pretend that injustice does not exist. Because I know that the enemy is active in the world and that there are sinners in the world. And that they're going to do sinny things. People are going to peep. They're going to do the things that people do. They're going to perpetrate injustices. They're going to oppress people. They're going to hurt people. And I don't have to be scared of that. Because God has already convinced me that I'm there. And I'm that person. And I realize how far short that I have fallen. And that the only way I can stand before God is through Jesus. And I'm no longer condemned. But I don't have to pretend things are perfect. When I see oppression or injustice, I don't have to pretend like those things don't happen. I don't have to feel threatened by the truth of evil in the world. Because as Christians, we should believe in, in one evil more than anyone else. But the, the, the potential and the, and the promise of redemption. So when an injustice occurs, when my, my neighbor is, is harmed. When an unarmed young man or young woman is shot and killed. I can acknowledge the wrong that's been done. I can acknowledge the tragedy and work to make it right. When ideas about generational oppression are brought up, I don't have to shy away from those conversations because I know that that stuff exists. It's in the Bible. And we can start the conversations from there. I've shared this with you before, but when Trayvon Martin was shot and killed, there were more people blaming so many other people. There was no, like, there was no, no grief over the life lost. And the, the ripples that come out from that infect many other lives. It was just blame games. Who was at fault? Who was, it, who was, who was the blame in all of that? And with the right understanding of human nature, we can all say, I'm the blame for that. At some level, the, the famous G.K. Chesterton quote, what's wrong with the world? I'm wrong with the world. And we can face that kind of stuff and we don't have to be scared of it. And I don't know what the solution for that kind of stuff is. But I know it's got to be centered around Jesus and repentance and forgiveness and caring about the people that God cares about. And working to make things right. One last thing in, in verse 26. Amos says. You have lifted up the shrine of your king. The pedestal of your idols. The star of your God. Which you made for yourselves. There is a tendency to protect our interests. To lift those things up as the highest. 
the institutions that we cling to for comfort and security. The comfort found in a certain type of education, the things that make us money, our political parties or our politicians. Those are the idols that we can find everywhere and even in the church. But we cannot be so focused on our favorite things. The things that we have some kind of interest in, in this world, that we make excuses for the evil found in those things. We cannot be so focused on our slice of the pie that we make allowances for evil. We cannot call evil good and good evil, as Isaiah tells us. We shouldn't be afraid to call out the sins we see. Repentance only happens when people realize they've sinned. We can't be so complacent to say that that stuff is not affecting me. I'm good. In John 7, Jesus says that whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living waters will flow from them. And then John tells us that Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit. When I read verse 24 of Amos 5, but let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never-ending stream, I think that is life in the Spirit. That is a life shaped by the living water that comes only from Jesus Christ. And all I want for my life, no matter, no matter where that takes me and no matter how challenging that is for me, I want that kind of life. If we live a life shaped by that, man, you will not run your race in vain. And you will stand on that day and he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Pray with me. Lord, help our lives be shaped by you. Help us understand how deep that takes us. How much that changes our, uh, the way we interact with each other and the way we think about the world and, Lord, the way we think about you. Help us to be so overwhelmed by you and your spirit that we, we go out here crazy for you. Give us fresh wind and fresh fire, the fire of the Holy Spirit to to live lives that seek your justice and seek your righteousness and never change. Help us to see you at the center of that and how that just ripples out in our lives and ripples out in this church. And it's not going to look like either the left or the right. It's going to be looking like you. You. Thank you, Lord. Thank you and pray that you would just guide us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.